on uh, uh, the date of 9-11, I was uh, still in the Air Force. I was a Brigadier General Vice Commander at the Air Armament Center at uh, Eglin Air Force Base in Florida. Um, and I know exactly where I was. I was on the stage at the, at the base uh, theater, and I was talking to a group of contracting officers that were there for a conference. Um, so it must have been about 7.45 for Eglin time, because we were on Pacific, or uh, Central time at the time. Um, when the first airplane hit the first tower, uh, someone came out and whispered in my ear that that had happened. And I think like a lot of people, we weren't quite sure how to react at that point. Um, was it an accident? Was, uh, did something terrible happen with the flight plan? Uh, we just didn't know. Uh, I'd finished my remarks. I was sitting in the front row, uh, and then someone else came out and whispered in my ear and said a second airplane had hit. Uh, and at that point in time, um, I went back to my office. Uh, we recalled our battle staff. We weren't quite sure what we were going to do, um, but we thought we ought to be prepared just in case anything came down for us to do. Uh, and something you probably ought to know about the Armament Center is uh, that's where the Air Force uh, uh, kind of buys and, uh, and uh, invests in uh, new weapon systems for the Air Force. That's where we buy our bombs and bullets, if you will, in our business. Um, so one of the things we weren't sure of was were we going to have to accelerate any weapons programs? Because we didn't know who the enemy was. We didn't know what would have to happen at that time. The other thing we were concerned about was we had a lot of people that were on um, mobility tasks. And we didn't know whether there would be deployment requirements for us. So we wanted to be prepared in either case, whether we had to accelerate a weapons program or whether we might have to deploy a bunch of people. As it turned out, we did not have to do either one of those things. Um, uh, so we stood down the battle, battle staff after about, uh, after about, a, uh, about a day and a half. Um, I had lots of friends in the Pentagon at the time. Uh, and I'd like to tell you a little bit about the Pentagon and, uh, and what happened there and why, uh, why the death toll in the Pentagon wasn't what it could have been. Um, the Pentagon had been under renovation for a number of years at that time, and they were doing it kind of one wedge at a time, if you will, in the building. Uh, and the wedge where the aircraft hit actually was a wedge that had, had just recently been finished, and they hadn't finished moving people back into the building at the time. Um, so it really was a fairly vacant part of the building where the aircraft hit. Um, and so that's why there were relatively few, and of course one is too many, but relatively few casualties were about 125 members that were, that were killed. Uh, the other reason is that the, uh, the construction of the Pentagon, and I don't understand construction, but apparently the way it was constructed, um, when the aircraft hit, it hit the ground floor of the Pentagon. And the second, third, and fourth floors did not, did not collapse immediately. Uh, it took about 30 minutes for those three floors to collapse. So we saved about 800 people that were able to get out of that part of the building um, a, because there weren't a lot of people there, and B, because of the way the, the Pentagon was constructed. Uh, apparently the construction techniques back in the 1941 when it was built were a little bit different than today. So, uh, you know, I guess if there was any good news associated with that, is there were a lot less casualties in the Pentagon than there, uh, than there would have been. Uh, I think long term, uh, that day fundamentally changed the uh, the military services uh, forever, just like it changed our country forever. Um, it, it, it put us on a, on a footing, I think, where we weren't sure who the bad guys were, we weren't sure, where, uh, sure where, who our enemy was anymore, and we weren't sure where we were going to have to fight them. We didn't think we were going to have to fight anybody in the United States, and, and the United States was attacked that day. And so that fundamentally changed, I think, the way we looked at, at how we did business in the military. I grew up during the Cold War, uh, and there was one bad guy, but we knew who he, we knew who he was, that we knew where he lived, and we knew how we were going to have to have to fight a war with him. Uh, that all changed in 9/11 um, because we had non-governmental actors all of a sudden that we have to deal with. We had state sponsorship of terrorism, state sponsorship of non-governmental actors, um, and it also put us into in a, into very much a deployed force. Uh, when I grew up in the Air Force, you were either stationed in this country or you were stationed overseas at fixed bases. Uh, you weren't stationed, you didn't have large temporary deployments where you were over fighting in a war in Iraq or fighting a war in Afghanistan or fighting a war in Somalia or fighting a war elsewhere in Africa. Um, so the ops tempo for our people, the amount of time they were deployed and away from their families just went sky high uh, after 9-11. And it became a different Air Force and it, and it became a different challenge to keep people in our Air Force. Um, it's hard to convince people to stay in the Air Force when they've been in the Air Force for six years and they've deployed seven times. And they've missed birthdays, and they've missed anniversaries, and they've missed Christmas. 
um, not once but twice or three times. So it changed how we had to recruit and retain people. We had to be a lot more sensitive to the families of our people and what they were going through uh, when their members were deployed. So uh, as it changed, uh, I think the United States, as it brought us together uh, as a country, uh, as it um, gave us a greater appreciation for the roles that the military plays, that first responders play, play that uh, the fire departments play, and the EMTs play, and our police play, uh, I, I think it, it, I think that was good for the country, that we appreciated what these people do for us. Uh, and it's kind of sad to say, I think we've lost some of that today. Uh, I wish we had that same appreciation for our police, for example, that we had in the, in the wake of 9-11. There were many policemen and many firemen killed in New York uh, as, those, uh, as those buildings came down that were trying to help people. Uh, and I, I think we should remember that more today uh, than we do. I mean, it's kind of sad to see what's happening in this country today. Uh, so I, I, guess, uh, I guess I would say that, that given all the badness associated with that, uh, and it was horrible, it was horrific, almost 3,000 people killed as a result of those multiple attacks. Um, it, it really did bring the country together in a way that I hadn't seen in my lifetime. It gave, them, it gave us an appreciation for uh, the people that helped keep this country safe that I hadn't seen before in my life. Um, uh, so there was some goodness in that respect. There was a lot more respect for a flag, I think, than, than maybe we had seen in the past. And, and while it was a horrific event, that period of time, that 8, 10, 12, 14, 15 years following that, uh, brought us together as a country. We had a common enemy, and it's somewhat disappointing that, that we've lost that as a country. We're now so polarized today um, that uh, maybe there was goodness in that that we didn't recognize at the time, as bad as it was.